Good morning. Welcome to those of you in the auditorium, as well as those of you who are joining us by streaming, whether in Columbia or elsewhere. We'd like to welcome you to this engaging and interesting panel on peace proposals of victims in the Colombian armed conflict. My name is George Lopez, and I have the great privilege of serving as the Vice President for the Academy of International Conflict Management and Peacebuilding here at USIP. We are the education and training wing of this enterprise, which is, as many of you may know, is a bipartisan created but nonpartisan institution that works for the US government and for communities worldwide in trying to mitigate reduce and resolve violent conflict. One of the things that's most difficult in that agenda is not only the times in which we live, but what we find to be the movement from the development of an idea of peace to actually solidifying a peace accord and ultimately institutionalizing it so that peace emerges in a just peace kind of form, which deals with all victims of violence and the terrible tragedies that are the heritage of long-term violence. Of course, when we think of the Colombian conflict, we think of one of the longest standing conflicts in the globe. And the notion that we are possibly, hopefully, and certainly with the energy, creativity, and contribution of many of our panelists here today, very close to the resolution of this conflict through a viable peace accord that produces as much as possible a just peace for all concerned and finds a way to go forward in peace building is not only a high agenda item for USIP, but for all actors engaged in, in this struggle. Uh, we at USIP have been uh, incredibly lucky over the past years to have as our point person in Colombian affairs, Ginny Bouvier, known to many of you from her work, uh, three decades of work in Latin America, and particularly in the Colombian conflict. Um, on behalf of USIP, my role is simply to welcome you and excuse myself to go to another event, uh, unfortunately, and to ask Ginny to come up. But I want you to uh, make sure you know, as our good friend and colleague limps a little bit to the uh, microphone, that the rumors that have spread that that came because of her extensive workouts with the Colombian national team during their World Cup run. We, we've dispelled those, I hope. But uh, please join me in welcoming Ginny Bouvier. And welcome to all of you from USIP. Thanks so much, George. I've been a closet soccer fan since my daughter played every weekend for 10 years, and my husband and I sat and watched her. And I've been delighted to watch the World Cup series with many of you and with uh, those in our extended audience as well. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today to, to, to today's uh, Columbia's Peace Forum. Uh, I'm Ginny Bouvier. I'm Senior Program Officer for Latin America here at USIP. And we're pleased to host, host this particular Columbia Peace Forum session on peace proposals from victims of Columbia's armed, armed conflict in collaboration with the Washington Office on Latin America and the Latin American Working Group Educational Fund. These organizations have been steady partners in bringing the voices of Colombian civil society actors to the halls of Washington, and they are sponsoring the visit of our Colombian visitors this week. There have been a few changes in the program due to difficulties getting visas and shifting congressional schedules, but we will nonetheless offer you a strong lineup of panelists today. I'd like to say a special welcome to our two Colombian speakers, Luis Fernando Arias, an indigenous leader of the Canquama people and Secretary General of the National Organization of Indigenous Colombians, ONIC, and Jose Antequera Guzman, a founder of Sons and Daughters for Memory and Against Forgetting. These are two organizations that are bright stars among the constellations of the many organizations working for peace in Colombia. USIP has been particularly fortunate to support the hijos e hijas in their efforts to educate themselves and to create a network of young people who can bring their experience and their many ideas to bear for a more peaceful future in Colombia. Now, with the miracles of modern technology, we'll also view a video clip sent by Liberal Party Representative Clara Rojas, whose responsibilities as a newly elected congresswoman prevented her from joining us in person. In 2002, many of you will remember, 
Clara Rojas was kidnapped by FARC guerrillas when she was campaign manager for the Green Party presidential candidate Ingrid Betancourt. After nearly six years in captivity, she was freed in 2008 and until recently was executive director of the anti-kidnapping organization, non-governmental organization, País Libre. On behalf of each of the sponsoring organizations here, I'd like to welcome also members of the diplomatic community who are joining us, including Ambassador Francisco Campbell, uh, Ambassador of Nicaragua before the White House, Ambassador Juan Jimenez, permanent representative of Peru before the OAS, Ambassador Diego Pari, uh, Ambassador of Bolivia before the OAS, Ambassador Nilda Carre, Ambassador of Argentina before the OAS, and the many representatives of other governments from around the world, Colombia, Mexico, Chile, El Salvador, among others. I'd also like to welcome our virtual audience. We'll be accepting your questions and comments via Twitter during the question and answer period, and we'd love to know where you're calling from or where you're sending in notes from. We invite our social media friends to tweet using the hashtag Columbia slash or hashtag Columbia Peace Forum. The event is being webcast live in Spanish on channel one and I'm sorry, in English on channel one and on channel three in Spanish. Uh, it will be available in both English and Spanish on the websites of all of the sponsoring organizations. Kathy Ogle and Jessica Abreu will provide translation for us. Jimena Sanchez, Wola's Senior Associate for the Andes, will be moderating today's event, and Lisa Hogard, Executive Director at LOG, will make final concluding remarks. I'd also like to say a special word of thanks to Natalia Oyola, Natalia Tejada, Kelly Mader, Vicki Hudspeth, and the PAC team and AV teams at USIP, as well as to our partnering organizations, especially Adam Schaefer at WOLA and Adam Omar Martinez at LOG, and all the others who assisted in putting together this event. Before turning to the film with which we'll open today's discussion, let me say just a few words about the context in which today's discussion takes place. As those of you who have been following the peace process in Colombia are aware, peace talks between the FARC and the Colombian government since late 2012 have moved steadily forward and produced preliminary agreements on agrarian development, political participation, and illicit crops and drug trafficking. The remaining agenda items include victims' rights and ending the conflict and endorsement mechanisms for the final accord. On June 7th, the Colombian government and the FARC announced a framework for addressing the issue of victims that included a joint declaration of 10 principles, and they invited a delegation of victims to join the peace talks in Havana. Simultaneously, the parties at the table in Havana called on the UN and the National University to organize three regional forums, which have taken place already in Via Vicencio, Barranca Bermeja, and Barranquilla, and one upcoming national forum to take place next week in Cali, to collect and channel proposals from Colombia's victims, representing more than 6.6 million Colombians, to the peace table in Havana. Less than two weeks ago, the parties established additional criteria for multiple delegations of victims to go to Havana, and called again on the UN and National University to assist. They also engaged the Colombian Episcopal Conference as a guarantor for the process. These two vehicles of engagement for victims, the regional and national forums, and the delegations of victims for the peace table, to the peace table are the latest innovations from the peace table in Havana and respond at least in part to the extraordinary organizational capacity of some of the groups of victims in Colombia and to the desire to create a peace accord that will also lead to the reconciliation of Colombian society. Ensuring that victims' rights to truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-repetition are satisfied, particularly in a conflict that has lasted for so many years, is a universal dilemma in conflict zones around the world. The question is always, what happened and why? Who is responsible? How can amends be made? And finally, perhaps most importantly, how can it be prevented in the future? Victims are particularly well qualified to speak to these issues. While our hearts go out to the victims whose lives have been torn asunder by war, death, and casualties, we also remember that victims are not just victims. They are, as the recent Declaration of Principles posits, citizens with rights. They are stakeholders with ideas, with proposals, with contributions to be made. They deserve to be heard, and we're glad to provide this forum today in Washington. Before we turn to Luis Fernando Arias, Jose Antequera Guzman, and Clara Rojas Gonzalez by, by film, we'll be showing a brief clip 
under 15 minutes, from a film that was made by the National Historical Memory Center, the Centro de Memoria Historica. No hubo tiempo para la tristeza. There was no time for sad sadness. This is part of the national effort in Colombia to reconstruct historical memory and to restore to the victims their dignity. The film is available online at the center's website, and I've put the address on your program for today. Rough subtitles are provided. I would note that there is a typo in the, su in the subtitles that indicate that 20,000 people have been killed in the conflict. That figure should read 220,000. Let's watch now, and then I'll turn the floor over to Jimena Sanchez to introduce our speakers and continue with the program. Well, that was a very sobering uh, video. Um, good morning to everyone. I'm Jimena Sanchez from the Washington office on Latin America. I think what we'll do now is go to... Hello, good morning. I'm Jimena Sanchez from the Washington office on Latin America. Um, I think what we're going to do now is go and listen to some of the voices of the representatives of this um, tragedy, this internal armed conflict that has gone on for so many decades. Um, we will start first with Luis Fernando Arias, who is the Consejero Mayor of the National Authority for Indigenous Peoples of Colombia, which is basically the grouping of over 44 indigenous organizations throughout the territories of Colombia. Luis Fernando is Cancuamo and has himself and his family suffered greatly due to the conflict. Um, also, he has been unfortunately persecuted due to his really important activism on behalf of indigenous collective land rights. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Luis. Good morning. I would like, in the name of the National uh, or Indigenous Organization of Colombia and the 100 Indigenous Peoples of our country would like to bring you very affectionate greetings to each of the brothers and sisters who accompany us this morning. As Jimena, our friend, told you, my name is Luis Fernando Arias. I am a member of the Cancuamo Indigenous People of the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta one of the peoples that has had to face the armed conflict more than many others in the last 20 years in polit with political violence that is experienced in our country. We had almost a decade of, we had around 385 leaders that we had to bury. They were assassinated basically by paramilitary groups uh, being supported by the, the armed forces, the state armed forces. Fortunately, there have been international bodies such as the uh, International Human Rights Court and the International Human Rights Commission have been able to intervene and take action against this genocide that was perpetrated against our people. So that is a large part of the indigenous movement in our country from the last for the last 50 years. In our organization, we have registered since 1971 when the indigenous movement emerged, the one uh, now 43 years ago, 44 years ago. And this movement emerged uh, as a result of the more than 3,000 assassinations that occurred due to the armed conflict. We registered these assassinations and documented them. 90% more or less in the, la in the last two decades that these are consequences of this conflict that is in, exists in our country. We have also been able to register around 150,000 displaced indigenous individuals from various territories, various indigenous communities, hundreds of indigenous people who have disappeared 
And this, perhaps the most important case or most relevant is, is my colleague, Presidente Domingo, who after having been in Canada and having denounced this, the suffering of his people at the hands of uh, the armed forces, he was kidnapped, tortured, assassinated by the paramilitary groups and by Carlos Castaña, a then leader. Hundreds of women have been raped as a result of the armed conflict. Children, boys, girls who were recruited as a result of this conflict. And dozens and hundreds of directors or leaders, rather, who were are permanently threatened by illegal actors and by legal actors who are constantly pr prosecuting and persecuting the social and political movement of the Colombian indigenous peoples. We have been in Colombia for we have been fighting for peace in our country for 523 years. And we haven't relented for one moment and not given up on the idea of seeing our territories constituted in peace sanctuaries. This is perhaps the main objective of indigenous peoples in Colombia. Of course, the indigenous movement in Colombia has celebrated very positively the opening of the dialogues in Colombia that seek to end the armed conflict. As you know, they are being carried out in Havana, in Cuba. However, despite the fact that in Havana there is discussion of the end of the armed conflict, which is a fundamental step to reach peace in Colombia, it is also true that in our country, armed conflict continues. And it continues fundamentally in the ancestral lands of indigenous peoples and in the communities of Afro-descendant peoples. These are our men and women, boys and girls, who are constantly and continuously victims of armed conflict. They are being recruited by all of the armed forces. There are rapes, restrictions on mobility, bombings, uh, civil persecution, and also desecration of sacred uh, lands, permanent and constant fumigations in our territories. These affect directly life and the integrity of hundreds of indigenous communities who are victims of massacres, assassinations, displacements. At this time, for example, we have around 400 indigenous peoples who are, or people who are displaced in the region of Choco in, due to conflicts between the ELN and the criminal gang, gangs known that are known in Colombia. That those are also known as paramilitary groups, and they continue to operate in our country. The armed conflict has also led to other types of conflicts and to other types of interests that have arisen in the context of, of drug trafficking, but also in the area of mining. And that is what is replacing right now drug trafficking and is leading to conflict in our territories. That is to say that there is a dispute in our air, in our territories for control of these uh, territories due to strategic and other interests that exist in our territories. So it is not true that we were at the point of signing a peace treaty when what we are seeing in our territories and in our communities is really the deepening of the conflict. Uh, so our community is working to put an end to this conflict earlier rather than later. And so for a long time, 
we have asked the parties in the conflict for a ceasefire and an ending of the hostilities so as to prevent the re-victimization of victims, to, so as to avoid that we continue to count the number of victims in each of the territories. Rather, we would like to create an environment for peace. For us, us, the indigenous peoples, it seems very contradictory that while we are speaking about peace, war is being waged. While we are thinking about peace, we're also thinking about buying more weapons, more helicopters, more airplanes, involving more soldiers and people in the armed forces, because we have half a million soldiers in Colombia. That's enough. So when we see these types of things, we see a lot of contradictions. When the education budget, the health budget, the budget for nutrition for children is shrinking. All of these are shrinking. If we just look at the, uh, the Department of Alguajir in the northern part of the country, the deaths of s thousands of children due to nutrition, uh, to malnutrition, due to the lack of potable water, because there are no resources to deal with the social problems in these communities of these peoples because all the money in the budget is going towards war. These are contradictions that in our, in our community we don't understand. We are not made for war. We are made for peace. Um, um, so, however, we're looking for a political exit and for a negotiated, negotiated exit from this con conflict in, in Colombia. So now is the time to end a conflict that has lasted more than 50 years. And as we saw in the video just a while ago, this has cost more than 220,000 lives of Colombians who have been assassinated. Truly, this is frightening and very, very sad to see such a reality. So at this time, what I would like to say is that although the conflict continues in the country and in our territories, we remain hopeful that we can put an end to this process. I would like to talk a little about the proposals of the indigenous movement in regards to peace. And later, I would like to speak about the victims in our community. In the last 20 years, we have been organizing our congresses, our assemblies, uh, our processes for social mobilization. All of this has been organized around the idea of resolving the armed conflict politically in a negotiated way. We don't think that the solution is military because it's been, the military approach has been taken for 50 years. And we have concluded that neither the armed forces can vanquish the guerrillas and not, the guerrillas can not also not win the fight militarily against the armed forces or the public forces. Really, the solution is a negotiated one, a political one. Secondly, we believe that there needs to be a definition of a human chain or human limits, areas that are declared humanitarian areas. And these would be the areas in which there are highly vulnerable populations who are vulnerable to physical and cultural disappearance. The Constitutional uh, Court of uh, Colombia in uh, 2009 um, qualified the situation of about 35 indigenous peoples as being in 
danger of physical and cultural extermination. This is a very strong political statement because there are peoples who are being extinguished in Colombia for various reasons. But when the Constitutional Court and the United Nations the reporter spoke of these matters, we saw that we're really dealing with genocide. In Colombia, there are indigenous populations and communities that will not endure another four years of war. They could disappear. That could would be the case of the Nukat Maku. The Hukat Maku were the last Numada people that was known in Colombia in 1988, 25 years ago. This people at that time had about 2,200 inhabitants. Now, there are only about 400 Nuka Naku in the country. They are displaced to the periphery of San Jose del Guaviare, displaced from their territories, and now their territory has been converted to a war scene, a, 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 an area where there is armed conflict continuously. So, the, the Nukanmaku, the Hu, the Guayavero, more than 34 people who have fewer than 200 or 300 members, they are on the, at the point where they will disappear as a result of the armed conflict and of all the underlying and related factors, because the conflict has brought with it the deepening of situations that already existed but that had, have become more serious and deeper, such as the issue of hunger, malnutrition, institutional orphanhood that you find in these communities. The uh, uh, launching of large industrial mining projects in these territories, drug trafficking, and all of these elements that have involved the displacement and the, dis and the systematic disappearance of dozens of indigenous peoples in, this, in these conditions of vulnerability. As such, we have also been presenting the idea that although we feel represented in this table in La Havana, we are not really represented by FARC or the government, we have asked for a direct participation so as to present our proposals, our proposals. Fortunately, at this time, and at this point, um, we have selected a group of people who will be traveling with the delegation in the next week to bring our proposals to the table, not just regarding victims, but also regarding all the matters that are being discussed and that affect directly the peoples and the communities that I represent. One issue that is of great importance has to do with land. The end of agri the issue of agrarian reform and rural development because we are seeing with a great deal of concern that every day there's a great deal of territorial pressure on our territories as regards large mining projects, as regards large agro-industrial projects in terms of all of the territorial pressures that are associated with the armed conflict that I referred to already, but also there have, there have also begun to be territorial tensions among the various actors in these territories. While this is going on, the Colombian government is only thinking about protecting la large landholder interests, foreign interests, among others, to the, to the detriment of the rights acquired by the, uh, communities of peasant farmers, indigenous communities, Afro-descendant communities who have been in these territories for hundreds of years. We have had to, con to confront, for example, 
the eviction of communities that have been in these territories for hundreds of years. Um, and there's institutions such as the INCODER that are doing this legally through legal processes. And they have, for the, in their files for more than 10 or 15 years, the resolution to constitute these territories and to convert them into indigenous protectors. But it has not been possible. Last year, we had to see a very sad event uh, that there's a territory, Puerto, a region in, w in which there are many interests and that we had to appeal so that, that, that there would be cautionary measures taken to restitute land so as to avoid eviction of these communities. There are, in other words, many proposals that we have worked on in our communities and that we are going to continue to work on and to discuss in various fora in our communities. We have just to conclude, some concerns that have to do with the post-conflict situation. We are worried about reinsertion of the actors in the conflict, the issue of territories that have been mined, because there we think that there need to be mechanisms and procedures put in place so as to enable this process to go forward. We are worried that tomorrow the conflict will end, and in our territories there will be problems with this. this well, there'll be a problem with reinsertion and with with mines, and there needs to be more attention to this in Colombia. And we're concerned that it might generate conflicts internally. Finally, since we are here in this country. We believe that the support of the international community in this process is fundamental in political terms and as regards the US government. Very concretely, what we expect in the indigenous community is a change of the approach of the aid that comes from the US to Colombia. For 50 years, the focus was war. In the future, it has to be peace and reconciliation. It can't continue to be aid that is directed at strengthening the military apparatus, but it needs to generate conditions for peace and reconciliation among all Colombians. That will enable us to reach truth, justice, reparation, and guarantee fundamentally that what occurred with us will not occur with our children, with our grandchildren. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear from Jose Antequera Guzman from Hijos e Hijas, which is Sons and Daughters of Memory and Against Impunity. He is also the co-founder of another Hijos e Hijas organization for the identity, um, justice, and against forgetting and silence. He has created um, he has contributed greatly to the creation of the Historical Memory Center in Bogota and acts as advisor to the center in order to create spaces where crimes um, have been committed, such as in the Magdalena Medio region against the Uso oil sector. He's the author of multiple books and he holds a law degree and a master's in political studies. Uh, sadly, he is also the son of Jose Antequera, a leader of the Patriotic Unit Party who was murdered. With that, I'd like to pass it to Jose. Muchas gracias, Jimena. Y muchas gracias. Thank you to all of you for being here. I think we are experiencing a very historic moment in Colombia and the possibility of being able to have friends here of the international community who are interested in peace in, there in Colombia and in the world 
is extremely important for us at this time. I also want to tell you that it's an honor for me to share this scenario with Luis Fernando Arias, the Indigenous Organization of Colombia. In Colombia, we say that indigenous uh, peoples are our older brothers, and I think I am not uh, mistaken in saying today I'm sitting next to an older brother. For this reason, I'm very grateful to Wola for being able to be here with Luis Fernando and also for their very committed work towards peace and human rights in my country. I'd like to begin by uh, introducing myself a little bit more. My name is Jose Antequera Guzman, and I have the same name as my uh, uh, father, whose name was Jose Antequera Antequera. His, both of his last names were Antequera, which were uh, because my grandparents were cousins. That's not very c common in Latin America. My uh, father was murdered when he was 35. I'm 34 now. And we spend a lot of time in airports, and I have to think about how my father might have thought that day when he was murdered in the International Airport of Dorado. I would be very grateful to all of you when you go through the Bogota Airport to think that there we are asking for a memorial there to allow uh, people who go through that airport to see that not only was my father murdered there, but also two presidential candidates in Colombia were murdered there. In 1989, 1990, in those two years, three young people were killed. Uh, they were each uh, 34, 35 years old. They were very young. They were people who were leaders of national movements of transformation in the country. And I want to start with this story because this is the story of our organization, Sons and Daughters. There are many young people in Colombia who are sons and daughters of a particular generation. And that generation represents something very important in our country that we have to understand. And that is that Colombia was not always a territory with an almost uh, difficult, impossible to understand conflict and impossible to resolve. We didn't always have the conflict that we have today, which is now very degraded, very complex, very difficult. We have generalized violence in so many regions. There was a time when it would have been possible to resolve this conflict. We had many chances to do so. One of those opportunities, one of the most important opportunities for ending the conflict happened in the 1980s in Colombia. During those years, those years, there was a generation of young people with leadership capacity, with political formation, associated with projects for transformation and with social movements. And they put together a, a struggle for peace. And those were the years when they first began to talk about peace accords between the government and the guerrillas, not just the FARC guerrillas, but also the M19, the EPL, ELN, and other guerrilla groups that you may have heard of. During those years, we had an exceptional opportunity to be able to resolve the conflict. And it was an exceptional moment because we had an opportunity and a historic moment to build a new order of peace. And what happened is that on the one hand, there was a constitution that was put together, the Constitution of 1991, that proclaims the right to peace. A constitution that talks about the fundamental nature of human rights, a constitution that has included international rights and principles of protecting the rights of indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant people. And at the same time that that constitution was being approved in Colombia, there was a political genocide going on, the largest political genocide in the Western Hemisphere. And it's the most relevant and the most difficult case that the Inter-American Commission has had in all of its history. And that's the genocide case against the Patriotic Union. My father was a leader of that political movement. And the, the, there was a journalist who was murdered who interviewed him before he went to the airport that day. And they, he asked my father, what would be your number if you were murdered today? And the journalist said, that my father would have been number 721 of the members of his political movement, the Patriotic Union, that would have been murdered up to that point. At this point, now we have more than 5,000 people who have been murdered, exiled, uh, tortured, and so on. At that moment, we had an exceptional opportunity to solve the conflict, even in this context of political genocide against the uh, Patriotic Union, because the country was so 
hopeful for peace and because we had this new constitution. However, in the 1990s in Colombia, in spite of everything that we had thought earlier, in spite of the fact that we had this uh, reference point, uh, we ha they were the most violent years in the history of Colombia. They were the years in which there was a whole movement against the progress made in the political constitution. The constitution was based on an argument of the need to open up Colombian democracy, not only to recognize indigenous communities and Afro-descendant and even gypsy communities, but also to recognize opposition parties and the possibility that in Colombia we would not just have a liberal and conservative party, that we would have other possibilities. In Colombia during the 1990s, there was a whole series of massacres, almost 5,500 massacres, each one a collective assassinations. We don't know the total number of people that were killed during that time, but those massacres were all committed with the uh, idea of reshaping the country. And that message is important for me to tell you today because those who study the Colombian reality think that Colombia is just one more case of conflict in the world where irrational beings uh, clash for re natural resources or ambitious people clash for money or war. And Colombia is a little bit about that, but it's not only that. Colombia is also a country where proposals and peace alternatives have been created. And at the same time, it's a country where many efforts have been made to frustrate those proposals. So why is it so important now that we have this peace process? This peace process is important not only because, as many believe, it is an opportunity to be able to reach agreements between the guerrillas and the government as for their interests so that they will stop fighting with each other that affects the population that supposedly has nothing to do with the conflict. No, this peace process is also a way to have an opportunity to bring something that we haven't had before. It's a change where that not only is for the FARC, it's for everyone in the country who hasn't had access to education, health, and land, or access to political participation unless we join one of the two traditional parties. It has to do with the guarantee of human rights. It has to do with the possibility of going out into the streets to protest against an international war without being repressed by the police or be uh, murdered like some of our colleagues. It has to do with the ability to uh, join unions without fear of being murdered. This process of peace for us is not just about the possibility that the government and the FARC reach agreements. It is our uh, historic debt that is owed to us. We, sons and daughters of the victims of the armed conflict and the movement of victims of state crimes, we want these changes to come from a certain perspective. Some believe that the peace process in Colombia is the result of a correlation of forces of groups in conflict. When my father was alive, he once had to give a speech where he argued with his colleagues as well as others that there was a time that had arrived where the government could not destroy the guerrilla and the guerrilla could not defeat the government militarily, and that was why a peace process was necessary. In fact, later, President Uribe, who was the president for eight years in my country, he always said that it was necessary to continue war because now the military forces were going to be able to defeat the guerrillas. What's happened in Colombia doesn't only have to do with what the state of correlation of power between the state and the insurgent forces. Now we're talking about peace in Colombia because of a struggle that has a lot to do with the defense of human rights and the defense of the rights of victims. We're talking about the legitimacy of democracy in Colombia based on the recognition and the repudiation of the suffering that the political violence has produced in our country. And that's why this peace process is not just a product of the correlation of forces in dispute. This is a battle that we have won. It is a battle where we have given our stories and our experience so that those who think that war is the best way will, will no longer believe that and will no longer have legitimacy in terms of insisting on that only option. In Colombia, even if the conflict could be resolved 
militarily. We must recognize human rights, and that's why we must resolve the situation through dialogue and through negotiation. This conflict has a legitimacy based on victims only because of this, because of the struggle of the victims. And the struggle of the victims is not only the struggle of those who raise their flags as organizations of victims, it is also the struggle of peasant farmers, the struggle of students, because in Colombia, both small farmers and students and the rest of the country, all of us have lived through the consequences of victimization that uh, were suffered by a few pre people in particular. And that's since the big discussion that is historic now in Colombia that I want to ask you to reflect on is the historic conversation about what we're going to do with the experience and the pain of so many victims in the country. Why so much pain and suffering? For what? There are some in Colombia who say that the pain and the suffering of the victims is the best argument for continuing the war in Colombia, that if someone has been kidnapped by the FARC, then that pain and that suffering is the best argument to not reach any agreement with the FARCs. And on the contrary, we must continue to have a policy of war until they are militarily overcome, or who knows what the objective is. But those of us who have suffered on another side of the war, those who've, of us who have suffered from crimes of the state, may think that it's better to use that suffering to say, no, there's no possibility of reaching peace or to reach any agreements. But what we're saying that in our experience is not an argument for war. Our experience has to be the strongest argument for peace because only through the recognition of our story and our suffering can we discover what the reality of democracy is and to build it empirically, not just as a theory. So I want to propose to you three challenges, three fundamental elements that I think need to be defined today in the country that are at the center of our proposals but are also the center of our demands. The first challenge we have for building peace in Colombia is much more simple than what people think, but it's very important. The first challenge is that today in Colombia, in the Congress of the Republic, there is an extreme right-wing sector that is opposed to the peace process. They're totally linked, and it has been researched that they're uh, linked to crimes against humanity and with uh, paramilitary groups. It's a sector linked to President Alvaro Uribe, and they're not only against the peace process, they are responsible for many violations, and they have to respond to the, for their links to paramilitary groups and for crimes against humanity. One of the biggest challenges is if, that this sector is still enjoys impunity and political power. In that same framework, another challenge that we have has to do with the fact that Colombia needs to be able to deepen democratization in our country. And when I say to deepen, I think we really need to achieve that guerrillas will no, become political actors in democracy where they can discuss their proposals like we do. And so deep democratization not only means the participations of the guerrillas, it means that civilian groups also have to have a participation. We want an indigenous president. We also want a president that comes from Afro-Colombian groups, and not just because they're an indigenous person, but because from that experience we can think about a government that guarantees the agrarian reform that Luis Fernando is asking for, or the political reforms that we're asking for. We also believe that in Colombia we need to have a great plan for non-repetition, which is a point of concession, consensus that all of the victims groups have. This plan for non-repetition has to do with many things, but I want to mention some of the most important aspects for you. The first is that this process has to be based on truth. We don't know all of the truth in Colombia, and we don't recognize all of the truth. I'm a victim of a state crime, and in Colombia, the victims of state crimes don't exist right now. Those of us who say that our rights were violated as a consequence of political uh, plans of extermination uh, do not exist. They think of us as simply victims of casual violence, but we do exist, and we hope that the international governments will commit themselves to the truth in Colombia so that our existence can be affirmed and our rights can be respected. For example, the U.S. government could help us 
by declassifying their archives that would allow us to learn all of the truth in Colombia, that would allow us to learn the truth about the commitments and ties of multinational businesses, like the case of Chiquita Brands. But there are so many other cases that we haven't been able to learn about that we need to learn about. One of the fundamental elements for us is that in Colombia, the military doctrine must be reformed. The doctrine uh, from which the military forces act. Military groups in Colombia are still acting under Cold War philosophy. They still believe that social movements are internal uh, threats, that they're communist and so on. And that point of view needs to end because it's what's leading to the violation of the human rights of the people. If you look at the people as an enemy or as a potential threat, um, that is not the way to run a military force. In Colombia, we also need a commission, a commission that uh, documents all of these events. There's also a truth commission that is being developed in Colombia. We hope that it has international support so that in the future it can be an element for democracy in Colombia. We don't want a truth commission that just produces a report that people uh, read and that people research in universities. We want the truth commission to make of memory a scenario uh, where people can talk in the territories about what's happened so that young people can understand the war and that it can be discussed and debated because war is a historic experience and it doesn't look like it's going to end in the world. We, of course, are interested also in social organizations and victims organizations to be these guarantors of the peace process. Right now, there's a very great danger and a great challenge because victims organizations don't live on air alone. They also need resources and these resources are not necessarily mean that they have their autonomy guaranteed. There are some victims' organizations, because of their positions, are not able to access certain kinds of funding. But what we're saying that we want the international community's logic to change so that cooperation is real uh, cooperation, cooperation among peers. And we want equi equitable treatment and possibilities for true cooperation, not a paternalistic way of handling international cooperation. And our proposal at this point also says that we need a great plan for reparations. And this plan could have many elements and could be explained in many ways. But I'd just like to tell you about a conversation that I had a short time ago with a young woman from one of the departments. I'm a victim of a state crime, the genocide against the Union Patriotica, but there are victims all over the country. And Leticia in, from the Amazon was invited to a youth meeting not long ago. And a girl there said that she wanted to study law and be a professional, be a lawyer like me. And I asked her why she couldn't ask for that as part of reparations. Perhaps having the right to education was part of the reparations. And she said, no, that would not be possible. She said the law didn't authorize things like that. There are many victims in Colombia that don't know their rights. They think rights are limited by laws. And if there's something that the free peoples of the world know, those who want to be free, is that uh, rights do not come to us by laws, are not issued through laws. And I told her, uh, she, she, I said, maybe you can find a credit. Maybe you can find a way to become a uh, professional, to be a student. And she said, maybe that's the best option that I have. And she started to talk with her other colleagues about having a right to public education as a, a way of having reparations, that the right to a university education like the one I've had, like the one you've had, uh, changes the life of a person. It means that they don't have to continue to receive different kinds of cooperation. And we believe that the peace plan needs to be at that level. It needs to include education, health, land, housing, work. Reparations and non-repetition in Colombia needs to be generated based on these kinds of reforms. And in that sense, we're very interested to have the help of the international community, an international community that begins to understand that in Colombia, in addition to an armed confrontation that would appear to be irrational, there's also a social demands and political demands that have been tried to be um, obscured and they're finally are being allowed to come out. This would be real peace in Colombia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Muchas gracias.
Going to um, discussion, we're going to view a short video um, sent to us by Representative Clara Rojas. Clara Rojas, representative of the Congress of Republic of Colombia. Greetings from Clara Rojas. I'm a recently elected congressman from Bogota, from the Liberal Party. I want to thank you for allowing me to participate in this space and to tell you a little bit about my point of view about the peace process. As many people in the public know, I was a victim of the FARC guerrillas during six years. This experience allowed me to understand that it is very important for the peace process to make process significantly because in Colombia we need to achieve peace. This is not just a light thought. It comes from a profound conviction that in Colombia we can achieve peace. Other countries have achieved peace. Without a doubt, we have come very far. This is the first time in our history that we have a negotiation process and conversations and five substantial points have already been proposed and four have been worked on significantly. This is a matter of survival. This is a decision in the sense that we do not want more victims. We don't want more uh, violent deaths. We want peace not just understood as the absence of conflict with the signing of these peace accords. Of course, we won't have a total solution what will allow us to really make change is the commitment of the parties. As a victim, a lot of people support me, but because of the attitude that I've taken, um, given that situation, a lot of people ask me how I was able to do that. And I said it's because I'm very convinced that we must give the next generations a desire for peace. A mother who is able to reach reconciliation is able to give peace to her children. I have made great efforts so that my son and other children can reach peace in Colombia. I think we can do it. And I think we can do it because other countries have been able to do it. What we need is support not just from the international community, but to generate sufficient consensus in Colombia so that this process can not only be achieved, but also when there's a later referendum, later society can all go out in unity to accept that this is the best path to survival for our country. Many have asked us if it is necessary to uh, to pardon, to forgive, I say yes, absolutely. I have been working on that process, but this is not something that we can impose on all victims. What do I hope from the peace process? I want for as many people as possible to participate and to be heard. There's an immense need on the part of the victims of the conflict to be heard. What do we hope for them in this peace process? Some who will be able to go to the talks, not everyone will be able to go, but they're hoping for a plural and equitable representation. It's important to have parity between the victims of state and the victims of the FARC so that we can truly work on a process of reconciliation. What we have seen in these working groups that we have been uh, seeing is that we need to be heard, we need to be understood. We need to uh, have our dignity restored, we need our memory to be guarded, but most of all, we need to have the guarantee of non-repetition. We want to participate and participate actively, and we hope there will be a commitment on the part of the FARC that they also have caused harm, and in these process of reconciliation, they need to ask for forgiveness as well, to ask forgiveness not only from the victims, but from society as a whole. I think this is the main aspect that we are all hoping for uh, when it comes to these this peace process. Why is it important to have this process in Colombia? Because we must get past this conflict of 50 years. 
as I have said, other countries have done it. Spain has done it. El Salvador has done it. Guatemala has done it. South Africa has done it. Perhaps the experiences that are the closest to ours have to do with Spain, El Salvador, and Guatemala. We have learned a lot from their experiences. And and there are many things that we can learn on the way with all of the support that we could receive from the international community, not just in support, but also resources for the post-conflict period. I think we will definitely be able to achieve a stable peace. How will we achieve a stable peace? The President of the Republic on the 20th of June in his inauguration said that we are going to be the Congress people for peace. I agree with that vision of our president, because I believe that a stable peace includes the possibility of giving people universal access to education, access to health, access to employment. And these reforms are the ones that are important for us, the ones that we need to work on now in the Congress of the Republic. But all of these reforms must be leveraged by resources so that we can provide these services to the community. And that's why it's so important that the international community also be aware of the situation that Colombia is experiencing. If they really want to help us achieve peace, then without a doubt, we are going to need a process of accompaniment and analysis so that once the peace accords are signed, they will be ratified by the country and so that we'll have pedagogy, that we can have social buy-in through a referendum and so that we can implement legislative reforms in reality. We want citizens to think that they can go to school. We want citizens to believe that they can get justice, that they can get health care and work. Only in this way can we project a Colombia in 5 or 10, 15 years from now where we will have a stable and lasting peace. Spain has done it. There have been an many years now when they have not uh, had war. They've been able to reach stability in that sense. And I think if you look at other reference points, you realize that Colombia today has the capacity to achieve this peace. Without a doubt, victims are people who are capable of contribu contributing to this process piece. We have a great desire to participate, to be listened to, but we also need support so that the people who participate are respected and that their dignity is respected. This would be a great contribution so that we can overcome many things. It is very important that we work together to find these levels of justice that would truly allow us to reach a stable peace. Without a doubt, we need some minimum mechanisms of justice so that people don't think that anything can happen with impunity. And I think and in that aspect, we need to work uh, very closely in the next days, weeks, and months. And that's why the ref justice sector reform is something that's very important and why the legal framework for peace is so important, where we are going to have the specific parameters for transitional justice. Other experiences in other countries are very important, but who is really responsible for implementing this are the judges in the Republic of Colombia. So what I want to say that I feel very positive that this peace process could work. Obviously, it doesn't depend just on the government or just on the victims or just on civil society. We also need to make sure that groups who are operating at the margin of the law, like the FARC and the ELN, commit themselves and that they reach the conditions necessary to be able to give up their weapons. And we need to provide a road for them so that they can uh, participate in the social life of the country, not just the political life, but also in just everyday, ordinary life. To finalize, once again, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this forum. I want to thank you for thinking of me. And I want to say that it's very important to have these moments of information and analysis on the peace process in Colombia. And of course, I hope it goes well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to open it up for um, some discussion. We have about 20 minutes. Um, we have two people on either side with mics, 
And we ask that you please um, identify yourself. We're going to take about four questions and then pass it to the panelists. Questions? Right here. Good morning. My name is Juan Sebastián Chaque. I live in the United States, have been here for 12 years. Due to the armed conflict, I, you could say that I came here for that reason, and I'm very interested in the process that's taking place, and I thank you for being here. My question is, if we look at the FARC guerrillas and the paramilitary groups as businesses and one of the largest employers uh, in the parts of Colombia where there's not much of a state presence. How do you see the reincorporation or the reinsertion of these armed groups in public life, but also for those who are affected in very small villages and the peasant farmers there will be a type of unemployment due to the elimination of these armed groups. Well, I would add, well, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you very much for this invitation to participate in this forum. My name is Juan Pablo Lira. I am the ambassador for Chile before uh, the OAS. I have been in Washington for two months, but and I am also very connected to Colombia. I have lived in Colombia in Bogota for ten years, or lived there for ten years. I have had the opportunity to study in Colombia and to have relationships with many Colombians. I have, you would need to ask yourself a lot of questions because in addition to talking about a country where there is a process that is ongoing and has been for some time uh, uh, um, a process of, of an attempt at, reconcili at reconciliation, but in South America there's Argentina, there's Chile, there's Peru, there have been processes of internal conflicts with many victims where people have disappeared. There's been tortures, there's been rapes, and there have been abuses to human dignity. And there have been various attempts at solutions. For example, one question I would like to ask the members of the panel from Colombia is how they see the judging of those who are responsible within the government. And that is not a small matter. I'm talking about judging politicians and military men or other people in uniform, such as the police. But that's not everything, because a great distinction that happens with a peace or reconciliation process that uh, occurred in Spain, which was emphasized a great deal by Clara Rojas, in Spain there was no responsible party from the civil war until the death of Franco. None of them, no person responsible was judged or tried. In Chile, we are going through, or we went through rather, a process of dictatorship 40 years ago. When we came back to democracy 24 years ago, we have gone through a process of normalization little by little. And it is very surprising from a social and anthropological point of view how societies take a great deal of time to form, to heal. When we recently celebrated the 40th anniversary of the coup d'etat, it was very interesting to see how in the collective memory there was a resurgence of issues that had not been dealt with sufficiently. So there's the idea of going back and reliving and, and resuscitating so many spirits that are th flying around in our in our subconscious. But if they are not faced, they will repeat themselves. And of course, no one 
would want to see that in Colombia, once peace has been reached, that what happened 50 years ago would start to occur again. Thank you very much. From the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. <clears throat> um, qué gusto conocerle. What a pleasure to meet you. Many thanks. My question is whether this, whether the Colombian reintegration agency says that up to 10 percent of those parliamentary groups were processed uh, have re-entered marginal military groups. What are the mechanisms that Colombia can put in place or use to avoid the same thing happening with ex-combatants from the guerrilla groups? If you're not ta we're not talking about the leadership, but the rank and file in the rural areas because they have their training, their experiences that make them very capable in these types of illegal work. So frankly, they can earn a lot more money doing this work. And there's a great deal of social rejection in the rural areas and within that part of society that is the private sector, businesses and industries that don't want to hire these people. Hi, Annalise Romoser with the Environmental Investigation Agency. Thank you so much for your presentations. I appreciated comments about land restitution and collective land titling as a pillar for peace in Colombia. And I understand the land restitution law that was passed a few years ago has faced many challenges, despite having a lot of international support. And I was hoping you could comment on what lessons can be learned from the current land restitution law to ensure that the land piece of any future agreement be respected and perhaps more successful than what we've seen in the last few years with land restitution. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with those. Um, also, I would ask uh, Luis Fernando if you can elaborate a bit more about the indigenous movement's view of the drug issue and what needs to change um, in a post-conflict Colombia. So why don't we start first with Luis, and we'll go to Jose. I would like to refer very generally to some of the proposals or some of the statements uh, that were made and then maybe go into more detail in others. And then Jose will probably uh, take on other subjects in more detail. That's why I was saying when I spoke that one of the concerns that we have is the issue of reinsertion, or one of the concerns that we have. And especially the reinsertion of possible indigenous combatants. Because in addition to the economic issue, we have a concern that is cultural and territorial. Because whether we want it or not, they are indigenous. And let's say that the destruction of culture and territory for, a, for an indigenous youth Let's say that that will be quite complex. The involvement in the conflict will be for, under various varying circumstances. So there's the economic issue. But there could be ven acts of vengeance and reprisal, even love issues. There could be many circumstances. So with, as regards this reinsertion, when it has to do with ex-combatants in the indigenous communities, there's going to have to be a varying approach with various types of approaches directed, coordinated, and harmonized with the authorities in the indigenous peoples. Uh, this will have to be done through spiritual leaders, 
the work will be psychological in nature to some degree. There will be spiritual retreats, harmonizations, many days of councils, many days of reflection. But also, there needs to be a parallel work with the community so that, once again, this can be reinserted in the social and community dynamics within these communities. Also, there needs to be methods for applying corrections in a collective manner, social work, community work, that in the indigenous communities in Colombia are customary when you're dealing with justice in our environment. So for that, what we need is that from an institutional point of view, there be a creation of all these elements to be able to go forward in this type of process. We are going to initiate very soon a reflection on this issue. We're going to have six fora in different parts of the country to work on a proposal in this regard. A few weeks ago, we uh, met with the High Commissioner for Peace, we presented him with this concern, and he was very sincere with us. He said, we don't really have a proposal for this. Why don't you make a proposal about this? And we want to work with the communities on a proposal in this regard specifically so that tomorrow or the day after we can have our indigenous colleagues not join any type of criminal organization. Also, as regards justice and state agents, I think that Jose could give you more information on this. I would just like to say that Colombia, in Colombia, it has been very difficult to progress in the judicialization or prosecution of, a, of elements that have been involved with the murders of our various leaders. I would like to give my own example of my people. We, the Conquamo people, were ex around uh, 385 of us were exterminated for, uh, five minutes from the capital, where the military uh, operation of Jorge Cuarenta was working. He is uh, here in the United States and is known as alias 39. Nothing ever happened after this. When the battalion was five minutes away, we were assassinated, we were taken out of our vehicles, and we were made to disappear, and nothing happened. Today, that colonel, known as Colonel Mejia, has been prosecuted for certain cases, but other cases continue in complete impunity. Also, uh, the ex-governor Cesar Hernando Molina Araujo was involved. He was also prosecuted for certain cases, but at this time, he was even sentenced to jail, and then other processes were presented, and now he's fleeing from justice. There are many cases of state agents, both militarily and politically, where the cases continue in complete impunity. We have seen in some cases where the, pro the, pro the attorney general uh, pro uh, works when he's prosecuting an indigenous leader for rebellion or any type of political unrest, but when it's a matter of prosecuting and investigating the crimes committed by state agents, by our leaders, justice becomes slow and ineffectual. That's what we have to say to the Attorney General. As regards restitution of land, that is a matter that is of great importance. And we also need to look to institutionalization in that regard. This is a very important challenge as regards restitution of rights and satisfying victims. Really, the matter of land restitution is very important. In our indigenous communities, we have 
worked on, or we are working on various cases that are being documented. The first positive experience that we had was in Chocó, in which a judge uh, working on land restitution uh, with some cautionary measures and with Anglo Walachati, there were some indigenous communities that had been displaced by paramilitary groups, and then these territories where they were were occupied by this business. And that is really the modus operandum, the displacement by the actors, and then the companies set up shop, whether they're mining companies or agro-industrial companies, and they appropriate these lands. Thanks to these cautionary measures by a judge, the uh, use of these territories was contained and a return process to these communities was initiated. The same occurred in the case of Nariño, in the case of, of Bichava. Now we're starting to have significant and positive experiences, but we have also encountered a difficult along the way uh, to which I would like to call attention. This process for restituting lands, according to the uh, to um, law 1448 requires a study or an authorization from the defense ministry to see if there are sufficient security conditions in the area or no to be able to go forward with this type of situation. This has been an impediment because the government is managing the resource and, and so when they are talking about restituting rights, sometimes they say that they don't have the, the security conditions to do so. So we have a great contradiction with the government, but this is also a matter that involves the Ministry of Defense when it comes to restituting lands through the unit for land restitution. There have also been debates and discussions in this delegation. There's a colleague who comes from CESAR, who, which is the department where the first members of the military appeared who are against restitution of lands. These are the paramilitary groups that are holding on to these lands. These actors continue to direct from the jails here and in Colombia. They continue to manage the interests associated with these lands. So this territorial matter in the peace process is very sensitive and very structural. It was really the beginning of this conflict, the source of this conflict. If we don't resolve it, there will be many wounds left unhealed. Jose? So many questions, each one more difficult than the next. but. First of all, as regards reinsertion, it is interesting, this focus or this approach, if uh, armed uh, groups are businesses to generate employment, it is interesting because the Colombian army is the second largest army in Latin America after Brazil, but with a much smaller population than Brazil. In, when you talk about the Colombian military, we're talking about 150,000 personnel. And we all know that that is not only just a business with many employees, it's, it even reaches a social class, a, sec, a social sector in Colombia. The families of military personnel, if we multiply them by four, that would give us an idea that the military in Colombia is almost a social class. And one of the problems to be resolved has to do with the issue of reinserting ex-combatants from the guerrillas, the paramilitary groups, and also the challenge and the possibility that, uh, that of not have of a military force for peace. But we could also reduce the budget in Colombia so that what is being invested in a war model can now be invested in a peace model. We could have more members of civil defense, more firemen, more nurses, and doctors than military people. This is a big challenge. And what I think is of great interest to us is that at the end of the day, there is a debate. And we understand, and we have to understand, that the 
political solution of the conflict in Colombia means necessarily a change that is productive and economic in nature. Today, to be able to really resolve what is going to happen with ex-combatants and with victims and what happens in the territories, we need a productive change. And that change is the great discussion that we're having with the government. The national government currently, with which we have a consensus as regards the need to continue with the peace process, has a model in which the country needs to develop, build, and that there you need to deploy the ex-combatants, the, the military people, through large-scale mining, through developing privatization in Colombia. We have the idea that if we can, we follow the uh, experience of Latin America, it would be very, I think, pertinent to talk about uh, Chile, Chile and uh, others. When we talk about copper in Chile, they talk about uh, us restructuring the economy in Colombia so that the great resources uh, that are in private hands that can be socially uh, reinvested. And these uh, represent uh, a source of employment for ex-combatants. So that's the debate that we're having. One of the characteristics of this conflict is that we are not talking about post-conflict, but post-agreement. We're waiting to reach uh, an agreement to end the conflict, but what we'll see in the future, we hope to have a democratic, political, and respectful situation so the country can choose the, the lifestyle and type of uh, model that it wants. But there is no case in Latin America, Central America, that we will be able to resolve problems with large, massive population that have employment in war if we can't employ them in the social sphere and other types of productivity. And that really has to do with our productive future. There's also the, the challenge of racism. And when I talk about racism, I'm not, talk, not talking about the racism against the Afro population in Colombia. In Colombia and America, in Latin America, there is a state racism, racism that has to do with the way in which the Colombians, the Colombians view displaced populations and see them with a racist point of view. And also, ex-combatants are viewed according to their skin color and so in, in terms of their social class. So this needs to be dealt with so that it's not an impediment to developing an economic model that is beneficial to all of us in Colombia. Uh, there, there is also impunity in cases in Colombia that is almost 99 percent. It's almost absolute impunity. What do we hope in this regard? We are proposing that at this time, the country needs to devote itself to a process that is centered on truth. Maybe we're not being listened to in this regard. We are not for a model that will judge and, and jail everyone who has participated in the conflict. We understand that there has to be a just process that means that not everyone will go to jail, but we need to go to a, through a deeper transformation process because jail will not guarantee us non repetition If that were the case, there would be no more problem in Colombia, but it, in fact it continues because it continues from the jails. So this process has to involve not just the guerrillas in a special tribunal. We need to look at what the guerrilla have, the guerrillas have done, what we need to look at high military commands, we need to look at businesses, multinationals. This is a big challenge that we have. Because on the one hand, as regards the guerrilla fighters in Colombia, this is a reality. There has been the prosecution which whereas there has been a use of the prosecution as a as a weapon of war in Colombia. There are populations where if the order is that what has happened is, is the fault of the guerrilla where it could have been through other factors. Uh, the guerrillas are uh, are targeted and things are resolved in that way. So the special tribunal would mean would need political will so that we hope that the military people who are have this disposition at in the war can be judged for war crimes, for crimes against humanity, and we also have to include uh, exile. 
And you're right in one fundamental challenge is that Colombia is politically using the issue of military forces to be able to maintain the current status of things. One of the biggest challenges that we have in Colombia and all over the world, and I'm sure in the United States as well, is to keep uh, politicians from using the discourse of war to getting votes. This happens in Colombia, and it happens in Colombia in the sense that many politicians are building political capital just by showing war images and saying that they need to be the saviors of the country and that they have to go on certain crusades and wars to save us in Colombia. This has to change. We have to have a much more democratically educated uh, population and to have a deep democracy. We're not okay just with voting. The Colombian population needs to be educated politically so that their vote is an aware and, uh, and an educated vote. I want to tell you briefly that what happened 40 years after the uh, coup in Chile is also very illustrative of us. We follow the story of Chile very closely and the uh, human rights movement there. And I think Chile gives us a very important lesson. And the lesson is that the struggle for human rights never ends. And it, in, as in Chile, a lot of people won and they wanted to consolidate political and economic power by violating human rights. That happened in Colombia as well. Massacres happened all throughout the 1990s and massacres and disappearances in the 2000s and with people with links to paramilitary groups. So we don't think that our uh, extreme right is just going to go away. So that's why we need a world commitment to human rights and where victims are decisive actors in this process. Finally, I would say that in terms of the reinsertion of the various military groups, it has to do with this number of 17 percent of uh, paramilitaries who went back to uh, criminal um, undertakings after being demobilized. In Colombia, you have to commit to not resolving the war just by dismantling the uh, warring parties that exist now. The commitment in Colombia has to be to resolve the conflict by it is not by just eliminating the FARC as a criminal group, because there are so many groups that are using uh, drug trafficking and crime, and they're not. What would really allow us to have the scenario that we want is to make sure that the guerrilla leaders can be agents in building a new kind of peace. And I think we can do that by looking at international experiences. We don't want to repeat the experiences of young people in Latin America who ended up coming to the United States and being deported and then joining the gangs. We want to have a different experience. And that's, even though it seems a little bit absurd, I think the agreement for non-repetition is a set of uh, proposals from the victims and the Accords of Havana. Everything having to do with agriculture and politics is, is all has to do with non-repetition, not just the part of the victims. We would like to thank the folks who are following us virtually. Given the lack of time, we're not going to be able to answer the questions um, right now. However, we will answer them through Twitter. And I would like to uh, pass along the panel then to Lisa Haugard, the Executive Director, Latin America Working Group, to give us some final conclusions. On behalf of the Latin America Working Group Education Fund, uh, the Washington Office on Latin America, and the U.S. Institute of Peace, I would like to thank you for having come to listen to these important voices for the rights of victims in Colombia. I would like to add um, a few words from another victim, Maria Jimena Duzan of Semana Magazine, who lost her sister, also a journalist, to the conflict. According to the statistics, we are six million Colombians. Most of us have had to learn to deal with our tragedy in the shadows of solitude because society left us abandoned. To survive the sorrow, we drew strength from deep down we learn to survive despite the indifference 
and we have managed to disperse the hate that the heavy weight of impunity leaves behind. In Colombia, there will be, we hope, deep and substantive uh, discussions uh, in the next month or so about the victims chapter of the accord. And although the participation of victims even in this chapter is somewhat structured and limited, uh, it is a very crucial moment. And those of us in the international community, and especially those of us in the United States, which backed the war so heavily and now has a special obligation to back the peace, have a role to play. We must do what we can to ensure that the voices of victims are not met with indifference in our own countries and in Colombia. We must do what we can to call for a broad inclusion of victims of all armed actors and from all walks of life um, in the discussions of the Accords. And we should call for the serious consideration and the adoption of proposals they bring to the table. And the international community must surround and encourage these negotiations with the FARC, and we hope negotiations to come with the ELN, because the conflict grinds on as the peace talks continue in Havana, as Luis Fernando Arias uh, told us so, so um, clearly. And every day, still, there is a new victim of the Colombian conflict. But what is needed is not a month for victims, not an hour and not a year. After 50 years of war, what is needed is not just a chapter on victims, but a library. Not a month of negotiations, but at least a quarter century in which victims, their rights and their proposals are put at the center of national and international attention. Their proposals not just for reparations, truth and justice, but also for transforming Colombian society to ensure that the brutal past, never again's return, are a roadmap for a more inclusive society and for a just and lasting peace for all Colombians. And just a, just a final few words to thank you all for coming. Um, as we've heard today, the challenges ahead are great, but I think that the speakers here represent generations of uh, leadership for change and have really been very inspiring to me personally and I hope to our continued work on Columbia. Um, I'd just like to mention that there is a, an evaluation card that you should have gotten when you came in. Um, here at USIP we try to evaluate all of our public events and we would really welcome your input so that we can continue to improve and serve the needs of the public here. So thanks again for coming.